This is not and will not be America's fight alone. Our job is to find enough common ground. Yeah, I'm a kid from Akron, Ohio. To make history. Why did success? I had no knowledge. I'm running for president. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And welcome to the HuffPost Show. I'm Roy Seekoff. Yes, and we are coming to you live from our LA studio. My partner in crime, Mark Lamont Hill, is on assignment tonight. We'll be back next week. By the way, I have no idea what on assignment means, <laughs> but it sounded better than long standing scheduling conflict, you know? <laughs> anyway, we do have a great show for you tonight. Asif Manvi is here. Yeah. So is comedian Christina Wong. And TV icon Florence Henderson is here. You just gotta kind of sing, right? Here's the story of a lovely lady. But first, I wanna kick things off with This Week In, This Week In. Our look at some of the fanatics, fools, morons, and miscreants who caught our attention this week. First up, This Week In, The Presidential Circus. Mike Huckabee, Carly Fiorina, and Ben Carson all announced their intention to seek the Republican presidential nomination. Because just like celebrity deaths, hopeless presidential campaigns often come in threes. <laughs> yeah. Now, Huckabee launched his bid on Tuesday with a folksy speech in which he extolled the virtues of God and guns, and he warned us... We are now threatening the foundation of religious liberty by criminalizing Christianity. He's right. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time a cop pulled me over because of the little Jesus statue on my dashboard, I could retire. Huckabee also revealed a very interesting relationship with the truth. Apparently, he doesn't care for it very much. Take this claim. Did we hear him? Ah. We're gonna try that again. We're live, we're still streaming out over the internet, but God damn it, we're gonna get it right. Yeah. We are now, 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 it turns out, you may not know this, but Mike Huckabee has a very interesting relationship with the truth. Turns out he doesn't care for it very much. Please, God, take this claim. 93 million Americans don't have jobs. Yeah. Now, you see, that is a statistic that conservatives love to use. Uh, cue Rick Perry. I'm really worried about those 90 million people. They're out of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that sounds really bad. And it would be really bad if it wasn't a load of complete bullshit. Yeah. And what's more, it's easily refuted bullshit. You see, the fact is, only 6 million of those 93 million Americans that Huckabee is so worried about are people who actually want a job. The other 87 million include 36 million people who are past retirement age, 11 million who are teenagers and, you know, busy doing their homework, and there's millions more who are college students or stay-at-home moms and dads or, or just people who don't need to work, like Mitt Romney. Yeah. So, in truth, new unemployment claims are the lowest they've been in 15 years. So look, here's a note to Republican candidates. If you're not even gonna try to be accurate, just say like a bajillion or, or a shitload. Or you could say whatever number makes Obama sound the worst. Yeah. Now on the upside, Huckabee did secure Chuck Norris's backing. Yeah. No word yet on where things stand with the coveted Jean-Claude Van Damme endorsement. Rumor has it, he's split. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. Also tossing her out into the ring was former Hewlett Packard CEO, Carly Fiorina, who never having held public office is making her time as a tech company executive the centerpiece of her run. So that made it particularly embarrassing when it turned out that she'd failed to secure carlyfiorina.org. So that site now features 30,000 frowning emoticons, which represents the number of people that she laid off while she was at Hewlett Packard. Yeah. Now, 
if we are going to elect a tech CEO as a president, do we really want one who doesn't have the tech savvy to spend $7.95 at GoDaddy? <laughs> Finally, there's retired brain surgeon Ben Carson, who, like so many of the GOP candidates, turns out he is an expert on all things gay. You think being gay is a choice? Absolutely. Why do you say that? Because a lot of people who go into prison go into prison straight, and when they come out, they're gay. It happens. It happens. Uh, ben is clearly a fan of Orange is the New Black. I mean, you know. <laughs> now, the most entertaining part of Carson's 2016 announcement was his choice of campaign song. Now, he went with a gospel choir version of Eminem's Lose Yourself. Don't stop the that, but it's a good song. Now, I love that song. It's part of my workout mix. But really, for a conservative Republican, did no one on his team ever see 8 Mile or Google the rest of the lyrics? Here's a, a little sampling. His hoes don't want him no more. He's cold product. I gotta formulate a plot or I end up in jail or shot. Success is my only motherfucking option. Failure's not. And God bless America. Yeah. So, so meanwhile, candidate to be Jeb Bush told a private gathering this week that, quote, who I listen to when I need advice on the Middle East is George W. Bush. Yes, that George W. Bush. So maybe Jeb's campaign song could be Eminem's mashup with Biggie, Dead Wrong. Okay, now, if you don't mind, uh, I kind of want to take a moment to commemorate the fact that tomorrow is the 10-year anniversary of the Huffington Post. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, May 9th, 2005. I remember the day that we launched so well. Um, there was only 10 of us who were working on the site at the time, and we, you know, barely slept. We'd been pulling all-nighters trying to make our deadline. And uh, Ariana had done such a great job recruiting that I was the founding editor, and I was trying to figure out whose blogs would go up on the front page. I mean, we had Larry David, and we had John Cusack, and David Mamet, and Mike Nichols, and Ellen DeGeneres. There was, it was an embarrassment of riches. So I was so busy focused on that, the phone rang, and I, I answered it, and I wasn't prepared for a voice to say, please hold for Walter Cronkite. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, I knew Ariana had reached out to him, but I wasn't really ready for this. this. This guy with the most famous voice in America to say, hello, Roy. This is Walter Cronkite. I thought, holy shit, it's Walter Cronkite. I mean, this is the guy who told us that Kennedy had been shot, that man had walked in the moon, right? I mean, he was the guy who said, and that's the way it is. So I said, hi. And he said, Roy, you're going to have to help me out here. I don't think I really understand this blogging thing. So I said, look, here's what we want. We just want you to have a strong take on a hot subject and just deliver it like you were writing an email to a friend. And sure enough, that's what he did. And uh, a few hours later, Walter Cronkite's blog was there on the front page of the Huffington Post. Now, a few hours after we launched, a really ugly, savage review was published. <laughs> and the review said, and I have never forgotten it, so let me just quote it, HuffPost is such a bomb that it's the movie equivalent of Zhigli, Ishtar, and Heaven's Gate all rolled into one. Yeah, yeah. And they said, this sort of failure is simply not survivable. Ouch. Uh, but here's the good news. Cut to one year later, and the woman who wrote that review was a HuffPost blogger. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. So here we are. It's 10 years later. And those 10 of us has now blossomed into 850 people. Uh, we're in 13 countries, uh, soon to be 17. We're seen now by 214 million unique visitors every month. And it was so cool that last night the Empire State Building was lit up in HuffPost Green to commemorate the anniversary. Yeah.
And, uh, and this happened. Happy birthday to you. Wow, 10 years old. It's been 10 years already? HuffPost 10 years old? Happy 10th anniversary to the Huffington Post. 10 years old and taking on the world. Here's to 10 more years of insight, essays, and of course, side boob. A little over 10 years ago when my dear friend Ariana Huffington said, listen, I'm starting a thing called the Huffington Post. I said, Ariana, it'll never work. How wrong I was. Ariana created a place where people could express themselves. You are doing wonderful work. You've made my mornings incredible. Thank you for the role you have played in transforming the media business. What an amazing, innovative, entrepreneurial idea. Ariana, congratulations. Congratulations, Ariana, darling. It's my favorite website, you know, besides you porn. Ten more, please. Happy 10th anniversary, helping to post. Happy birthday, 10 years old. You don't look a day over seven. Maybe five. Yes. No, actually, you look your age. <laughs> 10 years old, you got to the double digits. You're a big girl. I remember when you were just a little baby. You're 10 years old, which means three years away from puberty. The tween years are awkward. I would have jumped out of a cake, but it wouldn't fit into my phone. Happy birthday, Ariana. Happy birthday, Huffington Post. Happy oh. birthday. Happy anniversary. I want to wish the Huffington Post a happy birthday. Congratulations, Ariana, and everyone at the Huffington Post team. Congratulations on 10 years of success. Woohoo! Yeah! Happy birthday. To you. Yeah. I mean, if you can bring together Glenn Beck, Oprah and John Bon Jovi, you're doing something right, right? Okay, but now it's time to move forward. It's time to think about the next 10 years, and we could start by bringing out our guest. Hang on a second. What? Oh, hang on a second. Uh, it appears that we have, uh, we have some breaking news. Yeah, yes, okay, now you've seen the headlines. Uh, now it is time to hear from the person at the center of this controversy. We go live now to the Brady press conference. Before I take your questions, I would like to make a brief statement. Oh, for heaven's sake, this report is a bunch of malarkey. I mean, anyone who knows me knows that I don't like smaller balls. I like big balls. In fact, I like my balls as big as I can get them. When I grip a ball or two, I don't want anyone touching the balls after me. I don't want anyone rubbing them. To me, those balls are perfect. And the idea that I'd send someone into the bathroom to mess around with their balls is ludicrous. Well, that's something Greg might do, or Bobby, or Peter, or Sam the Butcher, but never me. In fact, there's only one Brady who has a problem with a big, hard ball. Hey, you guys. Oh, my God. oh Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Yeah. Yeah. I am so glad that we cleared that up. Okay, now, back to our guest. Uh, you know him as The Daily Show's senior foreign-looking correspondent. He also created and stars in Funny or Die's Halal in the Family. And his latest project is The Brink. It premieres on HBO June 21st. Please welcome Asif Monbi. <laughs> Yeah, Asif Monby in the house. Um, I, I can't believe I had to follow Florence Henderson talking about her balls. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, uh, Flo Hen is talking that, balls. Is, is that the first thing that's happened since the 10-year anniversary, like the, the celebration? Yeah, of we went from like, Oprah, that, Oprah and, and then the Empire State Building, yes, little phallic, and, and now... just went, like, straight to, straight like, to the balls. get Flo Hen... Flo Hen and do the balls, balls. Yeah. 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 Great. I great. woke up and I thought, Brady, wait a minute, <laughs> we got us some Brady. Now, your new project is The Brink. The Brink. And it... So basically, the brink means we're on the brink of nuclear war, right? It's on the brink of global disaster, on the brink of... Uh, and, and what brought yeah. us to the brink? 
Well, a lot of things. Uh, you, you, you'd have to watch the show, obviously, yeah. to find out. Uh, but uh, yes, a series of unforeseen circumstances, some foreseen and some unforeseen. But I, but I hear there's a kind of a crazy general involved. Uh, yes. A little strange yes. lovey vibe. It's is that? Very, it is. You know, it's very, it's, uh, it's Dr. Strangelove meets MASH. Uh, you know, kind of, it's it's about, right? It's about it's about global politics. I'm still trying to picture that. I know. <laughs> it's like Peter Sellers doing this, and then Hawkeye. Right, right. And Hawkeye, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got all of that, you know. Yeah. But it's it's um, it's it's a very it's a great show. It's very it's fast paced. It you know it deals with it's a global political satire. Yeah. Uh, sort of um, the world on the brink of a global crisis, seen through ten episodes in real time. Uh, if Homeland was a comedy, this is the brink. That's there what you it go. would be. Yeah. And now you got a great cast. Tim Robbins. Jack Black. Jack Black. So you work mostly with Jack, right? With Jack, yeah. Jack and I uh, basically uh, spent, you know, many months together running around uh, fake Islamabad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. look, there yeah, we are. There are. Yes. That's uh, you, that's, right? That's and me. That's, uh, yeah, and that, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I can never tell who's who. Yeah. But you look very... I was going to say. Or, it, yeah. I'm it's pretty very sure hard. That's Jack. That's, that's Jack. Jack. There you go. That's you can tell Jack. by the tie. I, yes, yes. Otherwise. Well, yeah. This, yeah I, now, I, I, go ahead. Is he wildly improvisational? He's great. Uh, yeah, and we we got we had so much fun. You know, we're just playing off of each other and kind of. He he's he's a real. You know, when I I never met him before, and I, I thought, oh, I'm working with Jack Black, and this is exciting. I'm a fan, you know. And then when we got on the set, he was so uh, great about just rehearsing stuff and working stuff out and trying to make things funnier. And you know, we'd go back and forth, and so it was real. It was real. It was great. He was great to work with. You know. And so I, I really, I, and, and Tim Robbins is, is terrific on the show. There's Tim Robbins, Pablo Schreiber, Carla Gugino, John Larroquette. It's got a great cast. Nobody we know, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and me, and me, and I'm... Uh, Asif Mambi, yes, yeah. Yes. So now, you must have done some research, because the CIA, mm -hmm. State Department. So let me ask you this. Are we fucked? <laughs> uh, you and I? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. all of us, everybody uh, in the room. I think, I think so. If, if, if you watch, you know, I mean... You don't have to watch The Brink to realize that we're fucked. You know? Just watch the news. You just have to watch yeah, the news. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's crazy because, you know, we're doing the satire, and, and, and I'm familiar with doing satire. You know, I've been doing it on The Daily Show, but you sometimes realize that, like, it's not that far away from the way things really operate, you know? Yeah. Uh, in, in, on The Brink, we get to do it in, in a narrative form. You know, we get to tell a story about... And, and, and you know, the, it, the, the show goes between sort of the State Department, the Foreign Service, and the military, and it sort of moves between these three arenas all following one crisis. And you realize, um, you know, we don't... We, don't uh, we, we take shots at everyone. We're, we're, yeah. we're kind of an equal opportunity offender on the show, so... <laughs> Speaking of offending, yes. uh, y your yes. other show, Halal in the Family. Halal in the Family, yeah, uh, yes. Now, this this is a... a title that's totally kosher, yeah. so it's great. <laughs> Who did he there? Right? We saw what he did there, yeah. Now, why don't we, for those of you who haven't seen it, what's the matter with you? Uh, let's, let's look at a quick clip. All right. I gotcha! <laughs> You're working for the FBI. I'm not the mole. You're the mole. You're talking to the feds right now. That was my wife. She says I'm crazy. You're both crazy. Neither one of you is a mole. Oh, boy. <laughs> I feel so dumb. So are you saying this is just a crazy mix-up due to the fact that Muslims, Muslims live under constant surveillance, surveillance that few other groups are subjected to, while the FBI is busy recruiting, recruiting people in our own community, community to spy on us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, there's obviously a lot going on there. We've got we've yeah. got the parody of the uh, sort of 80s comedy, yeah. and we've got obviously a pretty serious commentary on. Yeah, you know, we, it all started. We about five years ago, we did a sketch on the Daily Show, inspired by something that Katie Couric had said, which was that maybe American Muslims needed their own Cosby Show, right? So we took that literally, and we created a show, sweater and all, the whole thing, and we created this parody sitcom. And aired it on the show, and it was it was really funny. And then and then a few years ago, I was approached, like a year and a half ago, I was approached by some people to do something in the space of uh, an area that I cared about, you know. And I thought, well, I wanted to talk about anti-Muslim bigotry and uh, Islamophobia and all that kind of stuff. So we thought we would resurrect this idea of this 
parody sitcom and use it to talk about some real issues, you know? And it's been great. I mean, the, we, we, there's four episodes. They're on Funny or Die and Halal in the Family TV. You can check it out there. And they're five minutes each. And, you know, we sort of took the tropes of a traditional all-American sitcom, an all-American family that happens to be Muslim. And the whole, the whole premise of it is that they're just so afraid that people are going to think they're that kind of Muslim, you know? Yeah. So they just don't want white people to be afraid of them. That's, that's the whole thing. You notice there's a little... I, yeah, I, yeah, I noticed yeah. that the, the couch moved. Comfort zone. Yes, yeah, come, yes, I saw it, it'll, that. It'll be much closer yeah. when Florence Henderson comes out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you know, so here's the thing. You raise a, an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, whenever an extremist Muslim mm -hmm. has an attack, shall we say, right, or yes. uh, performs an attack. As an attack, you, you mean like, yeah, like a little angina. Or a little angina. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a little angina. <laughs> right. Yeah, a little, little, uh, little angina attack. No, um, when there's a terrorist attack, yeah. they always turn and say, where are the moderate Muslims? Yes, right. You know, why aren't the moderate Muslims right. speaking out? Well, well, that's the thing that always happens, right? Like, if, if, if somebody walks into a place and, you know, does some hor horrendous thing and then yells, Allah Akbar, you know, then everyone's like, Islam, it's Muslims, that's the problem. But, you know, but white people can do, like, kill people, maim people, and they're like, uh, they're just bad parenting. That's what happened there. <laughs> like, it's just, he went, he was uh, on the sauce, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so, what, you know, all white people don't get thrown under the bus, you know, when one crazy white person goes up and does something. So, it's, you know, it, it, there's stuff like that that we try to address on yeah. the show a little bit. Now, originally, it was called The Cosby Show with a Q. It's The Cosby Ca Show. Right. The Q-U-apostrophe, oh, I have to spell it out. Yeah, um, and that's but, your character's name. Yes, and, and, but, you know, but the title of the show is Halal in the Family because we really were also inspired by shows like All in the Family, yeah. you know, which really dealt with a lot of social and uh, political issues uh, of their of, of its day, and so we wanted to sort of uh, pay homage to that as well. You but know? you're sort of in the Cliff Huxtable role, though, right? It, I guess it's kind of it's kind of a combination of uh, Archie Bunker, Cliff Huxtable, and Al Bundy. You know, so it's it, sort of that. So that does world, that mean right? that like 25 years from now I'll be sitting here going, Asif, with the ladies in the pills? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, 25 years. I'm saying. I don't know if it'll be that long. You're, you're not, you're not, you're not like that, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, we, you know, we, we, we wanted to uh, look. The Cosby Show itself was sort of iconic in Americans. So, you know, aside from Bill Cosby and all the unfortunate stuff that's happened there, the Cosby Show itself was was sort of uh, an inflection point, I think. You know, uh, in terms of television. So. Uh, that was a source of inspiration. The show, not not necessarily, you know, all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk late night for a minute. You've yeah. spent a number of years uh, in that spot. Yes, I have. Uh, it's been a really weird year mm -hmm. for late night. I mean, we have uh, the retirement of Colbert. Everyone's leaving. Is Everyone's yeah, leaving. Yeah, exactly. uh, you know, so John. Yeah. John Stewart. John Stewart. Your, yes, your yeah. boss. Yeah. Uh, is the show going to be able to survive it? I mean, I know that uh, uh, John Oliver just did an interview uh, with the Jorge Ramos, and he said right. it's got to be completely different. Uh, that no one can follow in John's footsteps. Well, I mean, I mean that's the thing. I mean, John Stewart is is one of a kind, and I don't think uh, you know anybody will f try to imitate John or do what John does. But you know, there will be a Daily Show. It will. The Daily Show has incredibly talented people who work there, uh, besides John Stewart, and and so I think. The, uh, what The Daily Show does, uh, it will continue to do. Uh, but however, I mean, yes, Trevor will have to bring his own uh, unique perspective to things. You know, w when John announced his retirement, yeah. and I can call him John because I interviewed him once. Oh, so right. I feel, yeah, you yeah. know. Even, even I can't call yeah. him John. And he so made a side move joke, you know, so I yeah, figured he were Mishbuka, right. yeah. Mishbuka. That's a halal <laughs> word. Uh, but I thought that perhaps you might be in that desk. Oh, I thought you might be a good choice as the host. As, as the host? Yeah. 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 Well, so thank you. Now I, I don't want to. I don't want to pick at any wounds, mm -hmm. but I, I, I read somewhere that they kind of told you about that they picked Trevor in a weird way. Uh, no, I mean they just called me and said, you know, this is the, this is who, who, who has been picked, and uh, and and I found out the same way that you know everyone else on the show found out, yeah. you know. Uh, it was just, uh, I wasn't there that day, so it was a phone call, but, uh, no, You think they did it on purpose? <laughs> they, they, Asif's they, not they, here. Asif's not yeah. here. Get, just, quick, get Trevor, yeah, tell get, him. Get Trevor yeah, right now. The yeah. Put yeah. him in there. Yeah. Get him in the news. Sign the contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was, you know, look, I have a show. I'm doing The Brink, and yeah. I'm very excited about it, and, uh, so I, I was, A, not even available to do it, you right. know, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's, I'm an actor at the end of the day, and, and I love doing that, and, uh, 
And, you know, and I wish Trevor all the best. I mean, you know. Let's talk about him for a second. Obviously, yeah. big news. Everybody got excited. Then within 24 hours, these tweets came out. Yeah, yeah. And everybody was saying, oh, he's an anti-Semite. Yeah. Or, you know, he uh, hates fat women. Or he's just not funny enough. <laughs> well, you didn't read the tweets. I mean, that's what they were saying, right? So... Is he going to survive this, uh, uh, or is that all in the past? Is it like a Twitter storm that's gone? You know, it's uh, it's like Twitter. It's 140 characters, and then it's over. You know what I mean? It's like, I think that, look, once, once he takes over the show, the, the proof is going to be in the pudding. You know, it's like he's either, people are going to uh, find him entertaining, funny, all that stuff, and they're going to watch the show, or they're not, you know? So that I think really it's... All that Twitter stuff, I mean, people, you know, I mean, what are we going to do? Like, he, it's four tweets out of, like... 8,000 or something over the course of the, like the last several years. So, you know, if as a culture, are we going to judge? Or maybe we are. I mean, are we going to judge people based on a couple of tweets? Then I mean, there's a presidential candidate, right, in 2042 or something, who's going to basically gonna go back and look at his eight tweets from when he was 14 years old and find and the, the tax you know, that he did. It yeah, was a mistake. You know, it's like it's like yeah. is that, is that yeah. what is that really how we're going to judge people? So it makes it seem like oh, he wrote this all yesterday, you know. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's much to do about nothing. I mean, people. I think. Look, I get it. Daddy's leaving. Everyone's kind of freaking out. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. And that's what it is. Okay. You know? Speaking of daddy leaving, last question. Yeah. Letterman. Letterman. It's the countdown to the final two weeks. I know I you know, did, Letterman. I, know. I just uh, I got in under the you wire. You finally got in. Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited. So I mean, everybody now we're giving all this praise to Dave. How he changed late night. Yeah. Um, did he influence your comedy? I mean, I know you grew up in, in, in the UK. I grew up in the UK, but then I got, you know, when I got to America in the 80s, Letterman, you know, it was still, he was still on NBC after The Tonight Show. And, yeah, I mean, you know, he was the, uh, the uh, you know, it was great because when I first started watching Letterman as, as, as a teenager, like, he was the other alternative. He was the sort of counterculture talk show, you know, with the with the Velcro suits and throwing stuff. The Alka yeah, yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah. So you know, um, yeah, I think that he did. I think he changed the face of late night in a in a remarkable way, and I'm glad I got to sit across from him at the desk. Like, I'm glad I got to sit across from you, you sir. Nice I appreciate it. Awesome, Asif Mondi, yeah. just sit here for a second. Right. HBO's The Brink premieres on June 21st. And be sure to check out Halal and the Family. Asif Manvi, everybody. Thank you. Okay. And while Asif soaks in that love, I'd like you all to check out this HuffPost show explainer. Asplay. Going Greek. Tossing the salad. Whatever you choose to call it, the act of backdoor loving is definitely having a cultural moment. Earlier this year, HBO's girls got tongues wagging when good girl Marnie, played by good girl Alison Williams, received a raucous rim job from her partner and very clearly enjoyed it. Mindy Kaling and Comedy Central's Broad City also devoted episodes to taking a trip to Brown Town. And it isn't just TV that has anal on its mind. As part of its annual sex week, Harvard offered a course called What What in the Butt? I said What What in the Butt? While Cosmo ran a cute listicle offering advice on rimming. Plus, there are plenty of real life stats to back up the anal acceptance trend. A study from the Journal of Sexual Medicine reports that 46% of women have tried butt sex at least once, and nearly half of those claim they do it on a regular basis. So how did we come to this ass-centric state of affairs? Let's take a look. America's first crack at ass play was overwhelmingly negative, taking its cue from England's Buggery Act, which carried a death sentence. In 1779, Thomas Jefferson wrote a law in Virginia that would make sodomy punishable by castration, but it was rejected as too liberal because it didn't lead to an execution. This puritanical streak remained the law of the land for over a hundred years, with sodomy considered a felony in many states until 2000 when the Supreme Court stepped in and declared it unconstitutional to regulate which orifices people can stick their Johnsons into. And it wasn't just the government that took a dim view of traveling the Hershey Highway. In Alfred Kinsey's landmark 1948 study of American sexual habits, only 11% of married hetero men reported having tried anal sex. So how did Asplay go from distasteful to flavor of the month?
Many observers point to the influence of pop culture, including 1972's Last Tango in Paris, in which Marlon Brando memorably blended buggery and butter, Madonna's analingus-friendly 1992 coffee table book, and Sex in the City's Up the Butt plotline in 1998. Oh, don't be so judgmental. You could use a little backdoor. But the greatest cultural influence in bringing ass play to the masses has undoubtedly been pornography, which has undergone its own rear revolution over the last 40 years. In the 1970s, when porn was mostly viewed in CD triple X theaters, films featuring anal were relatively rare. This remained true even as VCRs brought porn directly into America's bedrooms. But by the time of internet porn, entering through the exit had officially gone mainstream, a state of affairs that led porn star Asa Akira to declare, ass is the new pussy. So this is the ass play moment, an era where sports fans sneak in a little butt licking before kickoff, groupies wax erotic about superstars who truly like starting from the bottom, and Peter Pan can enjoy analingus during prime time. But even with all this, some part of America's puritanical streak remains. According to Williams, before arriving on the girls' set, she had her wardrobe team construct a device that would ensure that her ass smelled like vanilla cake. Hmm. All things considered, shouldn't it have been chocolate? This has been a HuffPost show explainer. <laughs> well, now you know! <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Okay. Although our first panelist has stayed in the spotlight, doing everything from hosting her own cooking show to competing on Dancing with the Stars to writing a very saucy memoir. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I need to say anything else other than Carol freaking Brady's in the house! Thank you, Roy. Florence Thank Henderson. You. Mm -hmm. Show business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, how good was she in that video? Oh. Not, not the anal sex one. No, <laughs> right, yeah, good point. Now, our second panelist is a performance artist, comedian, and writer whose shows have included Wong Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest oh. and her latest, The Wong Street Journal. Please welcome, yes, Christina Wong. Hey. Now, there were a lot of compelling issues grabbing the interest of HuffPost readers this week including the dust-up over the writer's group Penn, mm. deciding to honor the staff of Charlie Hebdo with its Freedom of Expression Courage Award. That's, this decision, some of its members objected to because they didn't want to honor the paper's, quote, cultural intolerance towards Muslims, which then led Salman Rushdie to call those boycotting the event pussies. <laughs> now, Christina... Really? Did he really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Satanic verses and all, you know? Yeah, yeah. hello. Yes. Yeah, so, so, Christina, uh, as a member of the majority, women, uh, <laughs> is, there, yeah, is there a group that you won't go after in your comedy? Is there sort of like a comedic rules of engagement? I, I definitely feel like uh, there are groups that are already facing oppression that don't need me to make the butt of their of the joke their oppression. I go after that. Like it's I, I think the big challenge for me as a comedian is to figure out how to punch up and not down. Oh, that's that's good. So, but do you think that we? So yeah. yeah. But do you think you can't go make comments on Muslims because they're not in the majority? I think the the issue with this particular situation is the critique seems to be uh, it, it's 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 supposed to critique extremists, but the thing is in this country or, or most Western countries, uh, Muslims are so misunderstood and so and so visibly the other that uh, when they when when you're attacking extremism, it seems like everybody is. Is, is just draped as the other. Now, Florence, have you ever gotten a script where you thought, oh, this goes over the line either, you know, politically or morally yeah. or ethically? And, and what did you do about that? I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I did. I don't get offered a lot of things. Uh, you know, I, I will do almost anything for a laugh. As, as you showed, you know. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, Proven. I, <laughs> I do. I love to make people laugh. Uh, I, I'm kind of raunchy and naughty, uh, but I. <laughs> and we love that about you. Yes. Yeah. But I do have respect for all religions, and uh, I think we have to be very, very careful 
you know, it, yeah. because people, and now today, my goodness, you can't say anything about anybody. Uh, you know, my friend Whoopi Goldberg on The View, she calls the Pope Franny, you know. <laughs> well, a lot of people might be offended by that, but I think the Pope has a sense of humor. I hope so. Yeah. Everyone. Now, w then we had the other side of the free speech spectrum, what happened down in Texas, right, where yeah. the two gunmen opened fire outside a cartoon contest centering on drawings of the Prophet Muhammad, organized by the variantly anti-Muslim hate monger Pamela Geller. Now, what I think is interesting, look at her. This is the ads that she wanted to put on buses in New York. Oh, it no. says, killing Jews mm -hmm. is worship that draws us close to Allah. Uh, That's his jihad, what's yours. So obviously it's kind of like a black ops operation. She's yeah. going the opposite way to make people think that this is how Muslims are thinking. But here's the interesting thing. On the one hand, I'm not saying that they're the same, but we're, we're giving awards to provocateurs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who are pushing the edge. Uh -huh. At the same time though, I don't see anybody wearing like a Je suis Pamela. Uh, you know, sweatshirt. <laughs> so how do we choose who's the award worthy and who's the one we disdain? Well, in reference to her, I think someone like that has to really take responsibility for what they're saying. And, uh, and I don't think she has, you know, and I think she caused some serious uh, things to happen. Yeah. So I think you have to be very careful and be very responsible. I mean, like, you get by with murder, but... <laughs> Me personally. But it's funny. Thank you. And it's... God it, bless you for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> if you're going to do, do something uh, like that, you better be smart, you better be clever, and you better be able to make people laugh and not get angry. You know, because some people have said that what she did was the equivalent of yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? Exactly. It was, it was inviting yep. violence. She got the violence she wanted, and it sort of played into her own narrative. Yeah. I never heard of her before this. That's because you live in L.A. If you lived in New York, she's uh, stirring the pot there quite a bit. Oh, yeah. is she? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, see, I don't listen to people like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a look at another story that was uh, talked about this week. There was a big heated discussion online about whether the Avengers sequel was anti-feminist because it portrayed Black Widow as unhappy because she couldn't have children. So they said that Josh Whedon, who has created some great female characters, yeah. right? Buffy the Vampire Slayer, among many others. Right. Suddenly he was, uh, you know, anti-feminist, and they were out marching on Twitter, and he ended up actually leaving Twitter. Yeah. Now, do you think we should just think <laughs> this is a, a popcorn movie, or is it actually these kind of popular cultures or a way that maybe we can actually have a conversation about serious issues? Well, I didn't see Avengers. I have seen Showgirls like 675 times. <laughs> and I will say <laughs> that, but I think the problem is that there's, they're not enough women superheroes, right? And so when you've only got one in a sea of male superheroes, that everything that this, this female superhero does will either bring all women down or bring all women up. And so we, it's just more a matter of, of, of having more women-centered. Yeah, but, but I mean, uh, heroes cry, don't they? Yeah. I mean, and Scarlett Johansson, I mean, she is so beautiful. Why is that anti-feminine if she cries because she can't have a child? A lot of women feel that way. I don't yes. think that has anything to do with feminism, Christina. Yeah. 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 Now, Florence, when, when you were doing The Brady Bunch, right. uh, it was right at the nascent moment of the, the women's movement right. was, you know, starting up. Did you get any grief ever because Carol, who worked her ass off at home, but yeah. didn't work outside the home? Mm. Well, you know what? I used to beg because I've been working since I was eight years old. And, uh, you know, a lot of it not fun jobs, but I did it from the time I was eight. I begged for a job because I've been a working mother. I have four children. No, you can't. Alice is taking care of things. I go, oh, well, then give me a job. So when we started having all the reunions, I said, I will not come back unless you give me a job. So you know what they made me? Screw them. A real estate agent. Oh. <laughs> Carol, Carol, I know. Carol. I know. <laughs> so you, you did say, you did choose to work, um, and you, was that because just that was your work ethic, or you, you needed the money, or? No, no, no. You, you mean You why? mean you in real life, I'm saying, oh, Lawrence, no, you made the same decision after you had children, you didn't stop working. Oh, I, I was working way before my children, and I was, I was on Broadway. I worked through four pregnancies. As a matter of fact, do you, do you remember, uh, 
<laughs> well, of course, you remember Jack Parr. Of course. And uh, I was trying to do a little Jack there when I was remembering the Huffington Post. Uh, oh, yeah. Just a little <laughs> in my own head. I was just the, not as good, but, you know. Oh, the great uh, Jackie, uh, you know, the one that was used yeah, to, yeah, the yeah. great comic, Jackie. Uh, yeah, 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 what is yeah, Jackie, yes, yes. Yeah, well, Jackie Leonard. Jackie, Jackie God, Leonard. God bless you, Thank Jackie, you, God bless you, forgive yeah. me. But I was You're all too months. young, Jackie Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, Jews, yeah, well, they would do like, this when they told the joke, and it was signifying that the punchline was being delivered. Right. The punchline was being delivered. You know. Well, I was on I was on uh, Jack Parr, Johnny Carson, and I was eight months pregnant. And so I always pace before I perform. I, I just have to keep moving. And I'm, you know, pacing up and down outside the green room. And Jackie Leonard said, come on in, Florence. Come on in. Sit down. I said, oh, no, Jackie, I really can't. I'm going over lyrics and everything. He said, come on in. Sit down. No, Jackie, thank you. And finally he said, come on in here and sit down. What's the matter? Are you afraid you'll wrinkle the kid? <laughs> nice. Very nice. Uh, now, uh, speaking of the Avengers, right, good, signal. But I'm pumped. <laughs> speaking, uh, speaking of the Avengers, yes. there was also this little, uh, again, on the internet, little dust up over this sound by Jeremy Renner went on Conan. And this is what he had to say. Yeah, so when I was asked the question, it's like, so, you know, Black Widow's been linked to Hawkeye. Iron Man, um, Bruce Banner, and, and uh, Captain America. So, what, what do you think about that? I'm like, well, I said, it sounds like she's a slut. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, mind you, we are talking about a fictional character and fictional behavior, but, Kona, if you slept with four of the six Avengers, no matter how much fun you had, right. you'd be a slut. So we're still Woo. using the word slut, and we're still slut. actually having numbers? We're, yeah, four out of six. Hey, you know what four I out of say? Six. Good for her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. No, let, let me. Oh, I mean, I think the Hulk actually should count as three because you know. <laughs> it, 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 I'm just saying. Oh, it's balls. a little yeah. beast. Um, now let me ask you this, Florence. You have two sons and two daughters. Yes. Did you have different numbers that you would think before that would be okay for them in terms of number of partners that they would have? Did you? With for the guys, was it hey great, and for the girls, it was not good? No, never. Never. I just tried to teach my children, you know, respect, responsibility. Um, there were a couple of girlfriends, you know, that I was a little nervous about, like, mm, maybe not. Uh, I tried to keep my mouth shut most of the time. And you try to give good advice to your kids. Mm. You just don't know, you know, yeah. uh, what they're going to do. But thank God mine turned out they're all Fabulous individuals. That's great, good to hear. Great adults. I mean, I, you wouldn't think anything else from uh, Florence Henderson or Carol Brady's kids. Now, there was actually a new study about millennials mm. uh, and uh, their sexual habits. And it was interesting. It said that they're starting and having premarital sex. Uh, you know, they're more happy with it. They're fine with it. They don't have any inhibitions about it. But they're going to have less partners over the course of their lifetime. I think they said eight was the idea that millennials would have, whereas the baby boomers, it was around 11 partners over the course of their lifetime. Florence is going, oh, geez, 11. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is, that be is, is that before marriage or during marriage? The whole time, after? your whole lifetime. Yeah. 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 Florence, now, there's so much. <laughs> yeah. I must read this book. <laughs> Christina, now, um, what do you think of that? I would have thought that this generation, I mean, I have a 20-year-old, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I won't even talk about the 15-year-old. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have a 20-year-old, and, you know, they talk about the hookup. Right, the hookup generation and all the stuff with these dating apps. Yeah, I would think the number would be a lot higher. This stat was shocking to me. I, w they, I was like, they definitely didn't survey my parents or any of their friends or anyone yeah. from my family because I was born out of um, immaculate conception. Yeah. Uh, that's how all Chinese people came into the world. Yeah, uh, it was really shocking. Yeah, because when I look, I, I feel like when I watch TV now, it is pornography or like when I just watch millennial yeah. TV, I like get pregnant just watching <laughs> what I'm seeing. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite convinced. It's you're not buying it. Yeah, not now, buying it. Now, Florence, in, in, in your book here, uh, I don't want to just say chap because. chapter eight. Be kind. Chapter 8. <laughs> I, I don't remember what I wrote. Don't remember it. Uh, you said that when you got married, you were a virgin. I was. And uh, I think the title of the chapter was, Yes, I was a virgin. So, so, so the question is, um, was that because you grew up with such a serious Catholic upbringing, or was it just the times, or what, what was the thinking there? No, I think it was because uh, the thought of having to go to confession on Saturday to Father Brown, who knew me, I never slept with Father Brown, but um, <laughs> Father Brown knew me. And I thought, you know, how can I go and tell something like that, you know, t t to him? I don't want anybody to know that. And so I think when you're raised uh, in a way that, that 
you just don't do that. You know, it's yeah. it's a sin and blah, blah, blah. I wish I had known better <laughs> because, yeah, I do for a lot of reasons. Well, it's interesting because the, the, another story that kind of caught my attention this week was there was this outbreak at a school in Texas of chlamydia. Oh, I, Did you see this? Yeah. yeah here, holy, holy crap. Holy clap. Yeah. Holy the, clap. Holy yeah. clap. <laughs> Holy clap! <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you right I gotta now. tell you. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. A clap! I gotta tell you. I'll tell you right now. I got the clap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Venereal. Damn near killed him. I don't know what that means. Um, but so here they weren't teaching sex ed. Mm -hmm. It was abstinence only, and it made me think. Well, you know, uh, don't you think it would be better to have safe, knowledgeable, informed sex than to allow Absolutely. this kind of STD thing here? Absolutely, totally. totally, don't you think, Christine? Mm -hmm. I do. I mean, and a lot of young kids today, I mean, I hear this, that, you know, they, they think oral sex is okay, that that's not really having sex. Are you kidding me? I mean, you did that whole film. I did. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Which Florence watched like this the whole, your yeah, face Yeah, I was great. like, oh my God. So much fun. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Florence, um, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but once again, I, I, I voraciously read this book. I bet. And you, I did, I did. Oh, you did. She winked and kind of gave me that bullshit look. But, uh, <laughs> but you actually saying here that you had a little bit of a, you know, a minor run-in with uh, a little SDD yourself. Uh, I did. And from a famous person. I did. Who, who, Could you who? tell us the story a little bit? Why, thank you for bringing this up, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> you said you like Saucy. Well, I did, it, it, and it's not something I'm proud of, but it's something that happened. Uh, and it's in the book that uh, I was good friends with John Lindsay, and he was out here, and he was the former mayor, mayor of New York. York. Oh. And uh, and we had a little fling one night, and the next morning I woke up and I had these creatures, <laughs> and I had no idea. I was like. What? What the heck? <laughs> I heard my brothers talk about that. You know, they were in the service and they would talk about it. <laughs> no, I did that. That was all I knew. And I called my doctor, my darling Dr. Georgie, and I said, I don't know what. She says, You've got crabs. <laughs> it scared the heck out of me. That's the only now, time I ever. For had. those of you who are too young, th th this was Mayor John Lindsay. Now, oh, I'm getting itchy just so, looking at it. So on the, on, on, the, on the one hand, you know, horrible, horrible story, right? He said they drank a little bit, and it was the same. But he's a good-looking guy. He was, he was a lovely man. So on man. par, uh, not worth it. Uh, mm, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh. he, he sent me flowers the next day and apologized. And, uh, and of course, I never really saw him again. I can imagine. Uh, yeah. Last question. Uh, we got to go. But uh, before I go, I have to ask you one question that's troubled me my oh, whole God. life. He's yeah. really. Yeah. No. It, it, <laughs> please help me. Carol Brady. Brady. Yes, Roy. Was she divorced or widowed before she got together with Mike? You can't find the answer anywhere. I killed my husband. Oh. <laughs> Reveal here. I was the original black widow. No. Uh, nobody ever said. Uh, but I always say I just got rid of him. Because, <laughs> you know, you, it seemed like kind of convenient that we were both available at the I same know, time. I know, at the same time. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, mm. The original Black Widow, everybody. Please join me in thank <laughs> congratulating them. Great audience. Thank you guys for coming. Don't miss Florence Henderson performing tomorrow night at the APLA stage event. She's going to sing, and I hear it's a little bit risque and fantastic. And you can also <laughs> check her out. Her moves on a Dancing with the Stars cruise this June. Yes. Yes. And make sure to check out Christina's show, The Wong Street Journal, I love that. which premieres <laughs> June 17th in San Francisco. You guys sit here for a second. Thank you. Now, the rest. Yes, the rest of 2015 is definitely going to be the year of the sequel in Hollywood, with new additions of everything from Pitch Perfect to Ted to Mission Impossible, The Terminator, Jurassic Park, Hunger Games, and Star Wars. But there is one sequel in the works that I am definitely not interested in seeing. Here's the trailer. The Iraqi regime represents a growing present danger. Evil 
is about to face the forces of good. Saddam Hussein will stop at nothing to obtain the most deadly, terrifying weapons possible. The belief is we will, in fact, be greeted as liberators. I am very certain that this military engagement will not be very difficult. The United States is prepared to use military force, if necessary, to make certain that Iran never acquires nuclear weapons. The dangers uh, posed by outlaw states such as Iran are greater now than they've been in some time. And Iran with a nuke is a disaster for us. Iran is a threat to peace in the world. Air and naval bombing of Iran's nuclear facilities would in fact work. seen the movie before. That is a, a movie I definitely don't want to see this summer or ever. Okay, before we go, we want to do our part to make your weekend a little bit better. We want to help ensure that you're well prepared and able to be part of any conversation. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a quick lightning round of party prep. We're gonna check out the HuffPost, and we're gonna give you a ready-made take you can use should any of these stories come up this weekend. Okay, our first story. We report you, oops. <laughs> Fox News apologized for reporting that a black man in Baltimore was shot while running from the police. In truth, the man's gun went off while being arrested, and there were no injuries. So if this story comes at a party, you say, you know, I think Sean Hannity had the most interesting reaction. He said that even though the story was made up, the made up guy got what he deserved for running from the made up police. <laughs> Next up, cutting remarks. After President Obama <laughs> mocked Michelle Bachman at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, radio host Rick Wiles called the president, quote, an uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> you say, Great. Now we get to spend the next two years listening to Donald Trump demanding to see the presidential foreskin. All right. Next story. Here comes the bullet. A Kentucky police officer was put on paid leave after his gun accidentally went off at a wedding, wounding his mother. <laughs> yeah, you see, it's a Kentucky spin on that old wedding tradition. You bring something old, something new, something borrowed, and something with a spring action trigger and hollow point bullets. <laughs> All right, our last headline. Yeah, you can applaud. Sure. We work hard for our laughs. Okay, last headline, like oil and water. To deal with the drought, farmers in central California are using wastewater from oil wells. Okay, look. The bad news is your lettuce may taste kind of funny. <laughs> on the other hand, your car can now run on Caesar salad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those are our takes. We'd love to hear any of yours. So just tweet them to us with the hashtag HPShowTakes. And be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, please remember, swipe right on Tinder. Yeah. So please join me in thanking Asif Monbi, Christina Wong, Florence Henderson, along with Mike Huckabee, Carly Fiorina, Pamela Geller, Allison Williams, Tushy, and all the other newsmakers who made this such an interesting week. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click here for more videos. And make sure to catch new episodes Friday at 9 p.m. on HuffingtonPost.com.